the, the, the voice, the voice thing. Oh, uh, my name. There we go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There we go. There All right, go. you're on. All right, you're on now. Oh, okay, cool, awesome. Do, 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 do. Oh, cool. Alrighty. When it, when it speak, speak. Yep, I, I can see the the thingy going. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like I'm on the cool. voice. All right. All right. Anyway, <laughs> so let's do it, shall we? Yeah. Yep. Alrighty. Welcome, everyone. Sorry, I'm shouting now. I got, I got nervous. Um, before we begin. As always, I would love to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, which are the Kurana people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, uh, and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, I think it's pretty cool that we have one of the oldest, like the oldest living culture on Australia, in Australia, and that that culture has its roots in um, storytelling and some beautiful artworks, and I think it's a point of really good pride for us, um, so I'd really love to acknowledge them. Um, and you know the great creativity they bring to the world. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about graphic recording, live scribing, visual notes, um, and a bit of graphic design stuff. Uh, so feel free to um, just ask questions, uh, particularly when I'm talking a lot. Uh, I'll probably jump around a little bit. Yes, Cassie? Is that meant to show like that? Yeah. Oh wait, no, it's not supposed to show like that. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Thank you. <laughs> the other way around, there you go. Oh my gosh, I practiced that six times and of course I forgot to do it. That's okay, um, that's okay. So you'll probably get like more fun and enjoyment out of it if you interact with me a little bit, but if not, no big deal, I'll just keep talking at you. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, what is graphic recording and live scribing? Uh, you may have seen me in class doing it, um, but ultimately it is the form of visual notes. Um, it's really about distilling down content or presentations into some really punchy, clear um, things and just creating a really pretty visual that engages people but also provides value um, through information. It's not just about pretty but also about, um, you know, containing something that people actually want to read. Um, so I've been doing these all semester uh, for a lot of my classes. They've been lots of fun because they've been lots of personal work. Um, you may have already noticed a spelling mistake or two. Uh, I am not a speller, so you'll see a couple of them today. But, um, you know, this is the way I think and distill information. Uh, I have always been someone, if I don't write it down, I will promptly forget. And that sort of naturally sort of evolved into kick-ass notes, if I do toot my own taunt one. Um, so I'll just hit, if I do that, will it play? Um, so this is a little video of just, um, you know, sort of a bit of the, what it kind of looks like as I'm doing it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm doing these while people are talking um, and just listening. It's the art of being able to listen and draw at the same time. Um, and you can kind of see how they start kind of simply, a couple of lines, um, and then they start progressing into, uh, you know, kind of colour and shape and form. Uh, I've spent a couple of years doing this sort of stuff, so I've built up a bit of a visual library and it's you know, something that we keep hearing a lot through our classes. And uh, I guess I noticed one of the key differences between graphic recording and sort of illustration is uh, that library. So when you're doing illustration, you're looking for references that are accurate, uh, you're trying to draw that accuracy, um, you're trying to really uh, expand and test uh, sort of assumptions. I suppose, around what things look like. Um, but for graphic recording, what you're really trying to do is find and use common language and iconography. So uh, Tim was sort of saying, like, you know, when you say you draw, was it Tim or um, Simon, maybe? Anyway, one of the guys was saying that, like, when people go to draw a phone, they'll draw, you know, like the, one of those old school handset phones, because that is a common symbol and uh, language for representing phones. Um, and so graphic recording and uh, a lot of graphic design and information design relies really heavily on those sort of common uh, distilled pictographs or images or icons uh, to really clarify and instantly communicate what you're talking about. Um, you know, the phone might not necessarily be accurately represented as, you know, short form and shape, but as a, at, a, at a high level, you kind of get what that's saying. So, um, that's what graphic kind of recording is at a high level. Um, and I guess you might, might be wondering who I am. So my name's Dana. It's probably going to meet you all kind of officially. 
know some of you, I know some of you don't. Are you a student here? Uh, I am a student here. I am a first year. I uh, have recently moved from Melbourne to Adelaide, um, but I grew up in Darwin, so Adelaide is kind of kind of like Melbourne and Darwin had a baby, and I find a lot of comfort in here. Um, I've done a previous degree. Uh, I did a communication design degree and have a graphic design background, um, and have spent a bit of time doing some various designer roles. Um, I've been a graphic designer, I've been a business designer, um, and now I'm a freelancer. So I do a lot of um, those skills and practices that I've built up over a couple of years. I now do that for hire. Um, and one of the things that I do, is graphic recording for a living. I get paid to do visual notes, which is the best. Um, so I've done these, uh, you know, I, I would say I've been doing graphic recording for close to 10 years. So that's from sort of picking up a pencil, practicing, getting a couple of gigs, putting it down, picking it back up. Um, and now I'm kind of really pushing into this sort of space. Um, and I've done these for uh, uh, governments, I've done them for private events, um, and I do a lot of it through my my current position at my current job. So um, this was one I've done sort of within the year for the Department of uh, Australia's Centre for International Agriculture Research, um, and they were doing some UN discussions around food security, um, and so I did a post life scribe. So this one they provided a recording, and I just listened to the recording and did it. Um, but I have do these sort of things live at events. Um, like this one was a live workshop with the Syro crew and Think Place. Um, and I just sort of sat online and did this while they, um, while they were working through their workshop and things like that. Uh, any questions so far about me, work, graphic recording? Cassie? Would you say that uh, graphic recording or visual notations are dissimilar to bullet journaling? Uh, yes, I would say it's similar in the sense of kind of what you're doing, which is like using design principles, visual design principles to create a structure and take notes. I would say that graphic recording is a little bit more visual um, and a bit more, I would say harder because you're trying to do it live. You're probably synthesizing complex uh, information. So like you go back up here, I don't know nothing about food security, but I have to be able to sort of glean meaning and figure things out as people are talking. Sometimes I, you know, I'll just be like, I know that that phrase is key. I might not know what it means, but it goes into the live scribe. Um, but there is definitely a very strong link. If you do bullet journaling and you're pretty good at it, you'll probably be pretty good at doing something like this. Um, but yeah, they're the same thing. Any other questions or anything? Nope. Uh, how do, uh, Cassie, would you better keep check online? I'm not sure if anyone is online, but if anyone is, um, just pop your questions in there and Cassie, can you ask them on behalf? I think uh, the Discord, the actual screen's not showing. That's probably about it. Also, hi, I'm Cassie. Um, I run Sketch Club. Should, should have probably mentioned this before, but... Um, yeah, we've got a whole bunch of other workshops as well, um, like this one. Um, so you go here and you go screen. But I don't want to share it. I just, I just want, I just want someone to watch it. So in case someone, yeah, no, no, that, that's what it is. That's, oh, that's okay, what cool. it. You have to share it. There we go. All right, cool. All right. Yeah, continue. Anyway, continue. I'll continue. Um, figure out how to ask a question online if you're online. I don't know how to do that. Um. Oh no, go back to my, go back to here. I'll keep an eye on the chat if they ask questions. Yeah. Um, so this is some previous uh, earlier work that I've done when I kind of was really getting back into it. This was about a digital twin symposium. And this was about additive manufacturing. So like real hardcore technical science stuff. Um, and, you know, it, it can be quite tricky to sort of work in a space that you're not really familiar with. But, um, you know, and this was my very first one a couple of years ago. So you can kind of see, you know, it's like most sort of creative things. You kind of have to practice it and you just get better with practice. Um, and I just stumbled across this recently. So it was really funny when I pulled this out and I was like, whoa, <laughs> look at the improvement. It looks great. But even at a bare bones, this is still really good. Like it's got some strong headings. It's got strong sort of groupings and clusters. Um, and things like that. So what I'm going to do today is I'll introduce to you some of my thinking. Um, I crossed out theory because I was like, it's kind of theory, but like it's just going to be telling you some stuff. Um, I'll talk to you about some design, graphic design stuff and principles, which are very applicable to this sort of work and to the work that we do um, in, the, in, the, in the course. 
Uh, we'll take a bit of a break um, and then uh, we'll do some practice activities. Uh, as I said, if you want to kind of start doing visual note taking, it's ultimately practice. So I've got some things planned for us um, to do that. Um, <clears throat> so principles of graphic recording. Uh, so I'm just going to talk to these, but essentially in my mind, it's sort of three main things that you're sort of doing. You're distilling key messages and content. When people talk, they often open up with a statement, they'll waffle on a little bit, and then they'll close it with a really clear statement. Um, so you've got to be able to listen through a, through a story or through a presentation and pull out those key messages. You've got to pull connection between points. Um, not only are you crunching that down, but you've got to be able to relate it. Is, it. is what this person talking about or presenting, what are those three things that are related? What are those three things maybe sits beside it? Um, or three things that are completely not related to the next piece of content. So you're trying to find connection between, um, between uh, connection and meaning between things. And then of course, drawing. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to be able to listen, synthesize, plan forward and backwards and draw at all the same time. That sounds really scary and complicated, um, but once you get your brain and you're in that mode of deep listening and just sort of listening and drawing, uh, these sort of things come together. Um, and you've got to do it and move and quick, be quick. So, <clears throat> um, what was the, my questions? Okay, cool. Uh, how do you approach them? Um, people might often see me just sort of walk into a room and start drawing as people present and think that is the case. Uh, sometimes it is, <laughs> sometimes I really do just turn up and have a right blank piece of paper. Uh, but more often than not, I've done a bit of a plan. Uh, I've gone into a session, I kind of know what the topics are, what they're going to be presenting. Uh, if I'm lucky, I've been able to look at slides beforehand to get a bit of a sense around how a event will, will, will flow during the day, but also around the topic stuff. And if I know that it's a bit more complicated, I might do a little bit of research to contextualize stuff so that I can represent it. Um, synthing and drawing, uh, as I said, it really is the crux of this sort of uh, work is around being able to listen and draw at the same time and synthesize what people say to what they mean. So people will waffle, but you've got to get to that, that headliner text, that one point, the bullet point that really makes sense and be able to draw what that means um, using that iconography, using that um, uh, you know, common language to really get people in and understanding what you're talking. Um, and you've just got to be able to move. You've got to be confident enough to be able to make a note um, and uh, progress <laughs> and progress just really rapidly and go be able to go back and polish at a later date. So I'll talk to you a little bit more around how I move through these sort of stages. Um, but essentially, you know, there's a bit of planning involved, there's a bit of practice and a bit of confidence that you kind of need to um, approach graphic uh, recording. <coughs> Apologies, I'm just getting a little bit of a cough. Um, and how do I do them? Uh, I use Procreate like 100% through and through for everything. I love this app. Um, it's got lots of features. It's got really smooth brush strokes and sensitivities and so many layers. Um, and it's Aussie made, which is a super point of pride. Um, oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, it was made in Tasmania by these, these two dudes. Wow. And now it's the leading drawing app on Apple wow. products. Uh, that is the catch, it is only for Mac, so woo, go Apple. Uh, <laughs> just to annoy Cassie there. Um, so uh, a little bit more on sort of how do I do them. So uh, just going into a little bit more of those principles and uh, the approach there. Um, so I'm thinking of overall of the overall representation. Uh, people, when you go into that, there's normally a topic, whether it's uh, the representation of the day is a bunch of speakers, so like it's going to be some portraits and some boxes around that, or it might be someone who's talking about a timeline. So physically draw a timeline like and place things along it. Um, you've got to think about that overall communication piece and what people are talking about and how best do I represent that as a whole on a page. Um, starting with the one, two, three, uh, this goes to a bit of the graphic design principles and information hierarchy and typography. So what is the first, second and third thing you want people to look at, read and absorb? Uh, 
you know, a lot of my examples and work and really good graphic design and good graphic recordings uh, have a really clear hierarchy um, because it allows readers to navigate a page, be able to consume it um, and give it a bit of structure. Um, you can't just sort of throw a whole things at there and ex expect someone to be able to navigate it intuitively. Um, there are ways to design to enable the eye to enable flow. Does that make a bit of sense? That's very technical graphic design speak, but I think um, I think you guys are kind of aware a bit about that anyway. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more about graphic design in a moment, but any questions? How would you explain that like, to someone who doesn't even know what you provide for them, what yep. we do, for example, so how would you explain that? Ah, yeah, okay. So I guess uh, the one, two, three explanation for someone who is not visual, it's basically what is the first, second, and third thing you want people to look at? Make that first thing big, make that second thing medium, and make that third thing small. Like that's essentially what that kind of goes to. Uh, the next thing is clusters and containers. Again, that's that synthesis piece coming through. Um, being able to draw information together, similar points, and then chuck them in a container. A container is a box essentially, or a shape or a representation. Um, again, that brings that structure and helps with that one, two, three level of information. And typography. Um, typography is the fancy word for designers news for text design. So it's um, the design of types and fonts and structure of information in there. From what I remember, it's been a while since I've talked about typography. Yes, Cassie? Would you say that like, if you wanted to do like comics in the future in the comic books industry, graphic design is something that like would look into that as well? Like you do uh, containers, you do typography, you do yeah. panels and stuff like that. I think that's something that um, if you wanted to look into comic books, that's something that you definitely would have to um, look into. Yeah, yeah, you're very right. So uh, that question of um, if you're looking into comic books, comic books uh, have type in them um, and they have type not just in speech bubbles but in panels to describe motion or yeah. action or sounds. Um, and that is all typography and that is all designed in a way to enhance imagery or flow in the eye. Yep. So all of your pages that you create have a lot of work on them. They give out a lot of information from the same. Do you write it all out by hand, or do you use a thing where you create the alphabet and you can create it where you type it out? Uh, no, I do all my writing by hand. Um, the effort to create a font, I mean, it's a lot easier nowadays, but I can't be bothered. Like, it's it's quicker for me to, like, just edit it on that page um, and I'm very lucky like I've, I've spent a lot of effort like refining my handwriting and have a couple of like typography handwritten typographies yeah, that I can do yeah so um, but I you know I know people have made hand fonts of their handwriting and do that uh, the reason I don't do that is because I'm moving so quickly I'm moving around the page so much and the nature of the tool I use of procreate um, it is just kind of not in my process or my flow to sort of make a text box, type it out. It really interrupts because I've just got to move and draw and be able to to draw and write at the same time, essentially. Do they have a type? They do have a type feature in there, oh. um, but you have to go into a menu and get it in there. Oh, um, but if you want to know how to make type, just like tap yeah. me on the shoulder at the end of the session, I'll show you. But um, it's just, you know, you people use the tools to their to what best works for them in their drawing process. Yeah. Um, and when I get you to do some graphic recording, you'll probably go, oh shit, I don't want to type this. I just need to note it down really quick at the speed you want to do. Um, so I'll just break down a little bit further around what you know what some of this stuff means in the sense of my graphic recording scribes. So um, thinking of the overall representation. So this was a um, Unleash Hackathon graphic scribe I did um, late one night, a couple, couple months ago, maybe mid, mid last year. Um, and then this was one of those things where it was a presentation of five groups um, with a, a main facilitator sort of thrown between them. So my overall structure has a sort of top layer band. Let's see if I can get my mouse here at the top here. Um, and then this is sort of the contextual stuff. Any presentation you go to to do this sort of thing, um, if it's not a Tim presentation, they'll probably say, this is what we're here for, this is what our focus is, and this is who's presenting. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I knew that that was gonna be there, so I've made sure I've got that overarching band. Um, I've got a little bit of information here on the side here around the judges um, and the format. Um, and you can see already some of these um, key, key principles coming in. I've got 
um, some different variations on like headings. I've got contrast here coming through to make them pop. Um, I've got some different typography here just to make some interesting things happen. Um, but I've got you know a, a pretty this is pretty this is a pretty crazy one I will admit. Um, sometimes I do will get go a bit intense. But you know there's there's some main headings in the orange here um, that people so know. Proximity. Yeah, and proximity and things. Um, so uh, and then you know at the bottom I've got very clear sort of five columns you would say underneath there and you could kind of see that they all relate like you can read down and be like that is a that is a cluster of information here um so that was planned i knew that i would want i wanted a big overarching row with a couple of columns for the for the speakers and things so starting with your one two three what's big what's medium what's small um i've just zoomed in a little bit more to these sort of um uh, speakers here and I wanted them I wanted their presentations to be really big um, they, they I'd come in at a sort of end of a three-day process um, and this was sort of what they'd been working on to sort of shape up over those three days uh, across the five teams so I wanted I wanted these to stand out as um, if you only took five seconds to read it you might explore these items um, and then I wanted the second piece of information to be the, the problem or the context that they were solving and their team name to be last um, because that's the way I felt uh, it looked better. I, I felt that was the information that was most relevant or the information that people would want to see first up from this event. Um, but you can put that in reverse, right? You could easily have the team name as that big high level thing, um, that big uh, guiding thing of this is what sits underneath that team. You could have that challenge or that context as level two, um, and it would be probably that same level. Uh, and then uh, level three would be maybe the smaller stuff down here um, around the scene. So I hope that gives a bit, bit of a good sense of how that those layers work together and how you adjust them and change them. Uh, and then uh, clusters and containers. So do we have any questions about you know, thinking the overall or starting with the one, two, three at this stage before I keep pushing on with lots of content. <laughs> How do you go with uh, color theory? Oh, I love color theory. Um, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't tell you the color theory. Like, you know, I mean, I, I know what like harmonious color palettes, contrasting color palettes are, and things like that. Um, How would you do that, like? When you my graphic stuff. Um, so I, when I, I've pushed into a lot more color recently, um, but when I was first starting, it was very much having two or three colors. Um, and those colors would be sort of complementary. Two colors would be complementary and one color would be contrasting uh, because that immediately starts building a visual hierarchy, a one, two, three sort of method with you. Um, and, you know, for this example here, this is quite, I would say quite sort of almost monochromatic because of the orange, it's everywhere and the orange and green. Um, you know, looking back on this, I'm like, I'm probably not super happy with these colors. But at the time I was like, I always got to go for a really strong pop color for headings because that's where people use to navigate. Like if they want to know stuff about the focus of the day, they can see those words really boldly. If they want to know about prevention strategies for 20 to 25 year olds. That's really bold and um, strong there. Um, and then I use like opacities and lighter colors to to fade things into the background for the next level of reading. Um, a, a thing about graphic design and advertisement and content and social media and stuff in general is a ten like a five second reader, a one minute reader, and a ten minute reader. Like they, they and they, those numbers can be varied, but essentially what it means is you've got to be thinking about. If someone's only going to look at this for five seconds, what are those five things I want them, or like the, the three words I want them to read? If they're looking at it for a minute, you know, what's that next level of structure or that next level of detail? And then that 10 minute piece is, you know, people who are reading at 10 minutes, they're the ones who are reading like all the little post-it notes down the bottom, all the little um, squiggly bits here. Um, so you've got to think when you're synthesizing and creating your information hierarchy about that, like, when people engage, what are they actually going to see and what they're going to read. Um, <clears throat> moving on to containers and clusters. Uh, so uh, this is just some representation of what that essentially means. Um, it doesn't always have to be speech bubbles or post-it notes. Um, I've, I've used shaded colors in the background. I've used lots of different uh, methods, but essentially um, 
you can see in this middle piece here, I've got almost four big clusters going on. I've got something here, it's been a, been a while since I read this one, but there's something around Arizona State University. There's the set of challenges as a cluster, features and benefits. So um, that's, how I, I, that's how I sort of synthesized and structured it. And then you, the reason you can find those clusters is because I'm applying graphic design and containers to this. So quite clearly, you know, anything in a square is clearly a related piece of information. It's containing it. Oh, sorry, I mean, quick right click. Um, but, you know, in this top bit, we're talking about proximity. So we know that these, these are related because they've got the same color um, and they're all listed underneath these sort of things. Um, and these are pretty much the, the bare bones and the foundations of graphic recording. You've got to be able to put a box around something essentially and say, this is what I want to talk about. These are the three points. Um, you can tell that really easily. And every, every graphic recording I've ever done has basically had a speech bubble in it. So <laughs> I have a whole library of speech bubbles. Um, and there's a little bit more on some typography stuff here. Uh, you know, I, I do my note taking traditionally as well, not just digitally. Um, and you can see the different, particularly in this uh, left hand image, lots of different typographic, uh, typographic treatment coming in. Um, you know, all uppercase, uh, lowercase, sentence case, uh, boxes and things like that. Um, I'm not, just not very good at explaining typography, but <laughs> um, having being able to have essentially a heading treatment, a subheading and a body copy, I would say, like points uh, as varied, whether it be line weight, uh, capitalized color, um, is pretty essential. Like that would be something I would say practice. You wanted to really get into this sort of thing, really, really practice some some of those um, levels of information or those levels of typography you want to get to. Um, <clears throat> I'll just press play now um, and allow for any questions and discussions. But um, it's always just I think more interesting to see how something comes together. Um, so I'm, I'll just sort of talk to things that I notice if there's no other questions. Oh, I'm good. Um, so you can see I'm, I'm resizing things, I'm moving things around the canvas, um, you know, I, I'm writing and drawing at the same time very quickly. Um, but when, I get, when it gets too quick and too slow, uh, not when it gets too quick, I'm just taking notes, I'm just taking bullet points. I can come in and fill in the detail and the visuals in a break or in a gap, but in the moment if I'm just like I can't draw, I just need to listen, um, that's very okay, like you can just make some dot, dot bullet points and then go back. So like when I replay this, I wonder if I can replay this guy. Um, so, you know, you can kind of just, you can kind of see that happening. Like I've, they were kicking off, so I've had some time to sort of draw some headings, bring some imageries in. Um, you know, they were, they were talking again, lots of stuff, but it starts picking up speed really quickly around here. Um, and you can see, you know, it's just lots of note taking um, going on right here. Uh, but at the bottom here, uh, I've spent a little bit of time, you can see a sketch come through and then drawing. Um, these are all done during like, you know, during moments of quiet when people are working on something because I do a lot of workshops. So often people will present and then they go do something and then they come back and present what they did. Um, while they're going to do something, I'm just working on this. I'm coloring, I'm visualizing. Yeah. Um, what do you decide gets like a picture to go with it? And what do you choose like where it's just text and what's, what gets like, a picture to go with it? So yeah. I, I thought maybe just the important stuff get pictures, but I know some people notes you always have like a little drawing as well. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, so uh, predominantly, I would say uh, if anyone's presenting, they automatically get a portrait. People go nuts for a portrait. Like they'll love you to death if you draw them. Um, but beyond that, things like um, key headings and key points. So in the middle of, like in the middle part of this, you can see all those presentations, and they've all got imagery that talks to represent that. Um, it's it's that one two three principle again. It's almost like I would say level two would probably get the most illustration because level one tends to be a heading tends to be a bit of text or with a box or a shape or a color behind it. Um, and then level two is where things happen. Um, but ultimately it's kind of what comes to me in the session, like in the moment. Um, and that goes to that visual library and that being able to understand icons and iconography and that 
common language of visuals, right? I know that, you know, if I'm looking at this guy, uh, you know, that little, these little award guys, like that's, people know that that's an award, they've got first place. Um, and what I can draw, like, it's a, it's a really tricky question. It's just, um, you know, I just decide at the moment, I'm like, I know I can draw a box and it's also like, I can draw people very well. So I like to put people in there because I know that I am good drawing them. People like seeing people and people like being drawn. So I put that stuff in there. Yeah. Would you say that like imagery um, would help you remember what they said in that moment? Yeah. So it's like, um, say they talked about something for a whole, I don't know, minute and you just kind of either come up with a phrase and then an image with it. Yeah. Um, like say they were talking about I don't know, trees. environmentalism yeah. or something like that, <laughs> you just draw a tree and then like it's burning or some shit, I don't know. Exactly, yeah. That, that, and you remember everything that they said because you put that there and yeah. you like say a phrase and it'll be like, oh, I remember everything that they've said now. So Cassie stole my thunder, which was the, the, <laughs> the point that I was going to make at the end of all of this, which is um, graphic recording is not verbatim notes, right? It is not a, like I, if people do quotes, I'll try to make them kind of verbatim-ish, but it is that synthesized key message. Um, and it's about signposting information almost. It's like, here are the three things or the heading of the burning tree, just to continue your terrible analogy, but I love it. Um, and when people look at it and read it, they're like, oh, I remember them talking about the tree that was on fire and why it was on fire and what we can do to solve the fire. But you know, you might only write down, you might draw the tree on fire and say, we need to put water on it, right? Like, and people will be like, oh, I remember that and get that. Yeah. And that's sort of the representation and the level that you're trying to get to. Yeah. Um, that's a very simplistic version. You might need a couple more words, but, uh, um, or a couple more pictures, but um, that's how it goes. Yeah, dot points. Yep. How many layers is there on that? Oh, I'll, I'll show you after. If you want to come see my layer structures, come have a look at them. Um, but- Are you very organized when it comes to layers? Yeah. I have a process, uh, that, and I built it because the layers were going crazy. Maybe during the break you can like put it up. Yeah, during the break I'll do a bit of a, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get a demo going. But essentially, um, uh, I start with a heading layer, I've got, I've got a, what I call a frame layer as a base layer, so that is content such as like my name, um, it, there's stuff around, so do I have another slide up here? Uh, yeah, I got back up, oh, sorry, I've got to go all the way back uh, to talk about this. Um, so like content like logos, uh, frames, titles, so like that uh, food summit thing up there, that's the, food, uh, use the mouse, yeah. that food summit thing up here, that's like a logo that I brought in, that's all images and stuff. Um, so they sit on a base layer that I call a frame because it's just content that has to be static and they kind of have to remain in those locations. I have then start with a um, layer I call lines and that's just me Anything with line work, so like writing and imagery, um, sits on that layer. And then I make a new layer underneath that for color. Um, so that sounds like, oh great, she's super organized. In reality, it's me making six different line layers because I'm when I'm doing my clustering and stuff like that, it's easier if, say like how we manage, uh, how we effectively manage risk here, if all that like line work is a layer it's really easy for me to move and scale that. Um, so it's it's when I'm working, it's a bit chaotic, uh, but because I've practiced and made a process and I try to, I do try to label uh, when I get a moment of labeling or um, as I'm moving through, I am combining layers or separating things out. But essentially um, you need your color on a different layer in case you want to change your color, you need your lines on a different layer and um, you, need a, you need your frame to be static. So. I kind of, in variations, work to that principle. Um, and then at the very end, once I know the live scribe is settled, um, I will then combine those into three layers, um, and, but never combine the master into, into it. What do you mean by static? Static, uh, things that don't move. So the, the like logos down the bottom here uh, and this stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so things that I know that need to be in a certain location, they get just locked in and I lock that layer and I can't even draw on it. So that works really well. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, where was I? I was all the way down here. Uh, that's that. Tools. <coughs> These are the best tools for graphic describing. Uh, so I've, I've used a variety of, I've, I've used a, a lot of variety. I'm in Procreate at the moment. Um, but 
when I'm practicing traditionally in like my notebooks or, you know, I've done professional live scribes with just like a bunch of favor customer, uh, Castell markers. Um, but essentially the reason I've pulled these ones out is you don't want to be doing your live scribes with fine lines. You don't want to be doing it with a 0 0.01 biro um, because traditionally graphic live scribers are doing these sort of things on a huge piece of paper at the front of the room and you've got 30 people and they need to be able to see it from the back. So that's why I'm, you're, you're using really big fat markers and fat line works. Um, if I, if I ever saw a graphic recorder pull out a like biro to do anything for any like sort of beyond a notebook thing, I would be like, oh honey, like you're, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> um, so anything thick. So I think this is like a 0.5 whiteboard marker in the middle there um, and thicker is what I would recommend. Um, and paper I hope, paper. huh? Paper, you're paper size. Oh, paper sizes. Uh, so, I've done it on butcher paper because I know I can just sort of like, I, I went to a printer and basically brought a roll of like quite, I wouldn't say like the most fanciest cartridge stuff, but like thicker paper, like maybe about 120 GSM paper. Um, and it was just this big spool of it and I could just, it was A2 in width, but you could just sort of make it as long as you want. Um, I would always go for length over in for traditional light of scribes um, because um, they're a lot harder. They're a really good point to start if you really want to practice because it makes it forces you to make commitments and build confidence. Um, whereas, like I know, even I get trapped in my digital scribes of like, oh, I've, I've redrawn this thing four times and they've moved on and I've missed a point. So it's like you have to be you have to be realistic. Like, what can I get done? Uh, how do I make sure that I'm moving at pace? Um, and when you're doing that traditionally, you want as much paper as possible because. If you start running out of room, you've got to be able to either add more paper onto it or like really like start condensing and be like, oh shit, I've got 40 minutes left of this thing and I've only got A3 left. So you have to be really mindful. That's um, why it's better to do like digital. Um, well, not better, but like... More flexible. Yeah. It's, it's a lot more flexible, I would say. And I know a lot of people, I mean, I don't know a lot of people, but I know like I know lots of people who have transitioned from a traditional base to di just doing to digital. So I basically just do digital now, yeah. but I would always say practice in people. There's always going to be work and people always love having traditional work. So like um, it, on a further note around sort of traditional practices in this space is uh, you, you get to leave that work with them, but I would always say get it scanned, go to a, like most printers can do huge, large format. Uh, scanning for like not too expensive and you would just charge that to the client anyway um, so that way you've got a digital thing and because I can't spell uh, and you know often get my letters mixed up and things like that um, I used to get them automatically it was like yes you can have the final artwork but I'll scan it and then I would use Photoshop to edit any spelling mistakes um, so that they at least they had a really polished thing that they could then either get printed or share digitally yeah. um, would you say that like I would I, I prefer landscapes just because people uh, you know Western culture reads left to right um, people yeah. would do that so that works really well I've done really like portraiture stuff um, like I, I if I don't have a roll of paper I just have a one or a two like cartridge poster papers have a stack of them and I just keep sticking them up every time I needed them um, my digital live scribes at default are always a two um, I'd love to do A1, but then I only get like seven lasers as opposed to 12. So I like balance that out. Um, so it's just, um, but at, at its crux, you could do a graphic live scribe with these three, these four pens and a highlighter. And I think that's what this one was made with, right? Like a handful of pens. Um, so it'll be interesting to see who's brought what today uh, when we get to the practicing. So you can do traditional or digital. Um, but I would say if you really are keen to, to learn it, um, just do it in your book and your notes and stuff. So that's a lot of me talking and I need to go get a glass of water. Um, so let's take some break. I'm still thinking about your question. Like, how do I know what to draw at what level? I'm just like, I don't know, I just do shit. <laughs> some things I write things down and I'm just like, 
I have no idea what I'm going to do. You, you can be a bullet point underneath something because I, I don't know what to, to draw there. <laughs> I think it just comes with practice. Mm -hmm. like, it, it really is. Like, I've been doing these for 10 years and I do like professional ones, I do personal ones. As I said, like, I've done one for every class this, this semester because it's how I think. I remember I sat next to you and I'm just like, oh my god. <laughs> 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 you know, you kind of like speed, like, done. <laughs> yeah. So I really try to make, like, if you're really interested in sort of like maybe potentially doing some work in this space, like, you kind of have to get to a point where you can deliver a work within the set time almost. It's really, really difficult to do it in two hours. So if, if anyone says, like, can you do a two-hour session? I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But you're probably just going to get a handful of notes and then I have to draw on top of it. Um, but for a full-day session, so those those ones that I've been sharing on screen, I mean, all of the all the VED ones are done basically into three-hour classes, but all the professional ones are at least five or six hours worth of work. Um, and you have to, yeah, you have to get to some visual, like, yeah. <laughs> but I do spend like sort of thirty or an hour after every, not the not the um, class ones, but all my professional ones. I spend an hour polishing, or yeah. you know, like like any drawing. Yeah, exactly. It's um, like, can you do a two-hour session and you do like rendering and everything? It's like, oh, uh, I need to polish it and everything up once. Yeah. Like, you can't expect me to have this amazing masterpiece done in two hours <laughs> and like not edit it. And <laughs> yeah, um, but it's just that visual library. Like I used to print out like whenever I went to prep for a session, I would go and look at other graphic recorders in that space, like literally into Google, like graphic recording about environment, um, and just steal shit like nobody's business. I was stealing like an artist, like oh that person drew a tree. I like that tree. I'm gonna draw that. Yeah, inspiration. Yeah, I'm not stealing. <laughs> and I used to have like a little binder of like you know, five or six pages that I'd printed out so that when I was in the session, if I needed to, I could just be like, what am I going to do? Bang, put that on there. Like, yeah. um, but I don't have that anymore because I've got it in my head. So, All right, what I'm going to do is, uh, Lucy is not here yet, but I think I'm getting the sense we're all kind of keen to kick off again. How much do you get paid like, each, like, each uh... Scribe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so doo -doo -doo. it varies depending on time, effort, if I like the client or not. Um, and but tr sort of as sort of what I would expect is probably be anywhere between eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars per scribe. Oh wow! Damn. Damn, people, it's a hard like it's a skill. Like it's not just like I'm turning up a drawing. It's like I that like, I keep mentioning it like synthesizing, clustering. Um, that that it's your when you're doing it, you're listening so intensely. You're probably drawing on a point beforehand, and you're like, okay, now where do I put that point? So you're like, I'm listening to a point about that tree on fire. That tree's going to go there. Like you're planning as you're going. Like it's it's real. It's really exhausting. Like by the end of the, like it's like my. Imagine. You're just you don't want to talk to anyone because you're just like been listening so intensely. Um, but yeah, so you can you can you, if you get good, you can get up to that pay bracket, right? And you just have to have the right client with the right budget. Um, but I have done like. You know, I, I, the ones that I do for my work are sort of by hourly sort of stuff. So it's like, I'll be like, this much for the session, like two hours for the prep, whether or not I prep or not, but uh, two hours for the prep, uh, you know, whatever the time for the session is. And then I would gauge around, oh, how much time else would I need after that? And I nav nav navigate that conversation with my boss that way. But yeah. um, I basically have a rate for, for like, so a half day session. So if anyone had a four hour workshop, or eight hours, and it's basically um, for a four-hour one. I would charge. I'd probably aim to try and get five to eight hundred dollars for it, um, and that includes the you know, post-production delivery of uh, files. And then, you know, if if the client was being, if I knew they were bougie and had a bit of cash to spend, and they were really keen, um, I'm I'm really trying to get up to that sort of you know nine hundred dollars, sort of twelve hundred dollars per day for full scribes. Um, so fingers crossed. Some money. <laughs> How much would you charge one of those uh, seminar notes that you just for the um, ones you brought like? So that seminar, so if I was to do that professionally and sort of like, you know, if I was, say, I was working with CDW and yeah. I'd come along and scribe our sessions, it would be half day charge, so a, a, an $800 or $500 charge uh, for 
five or six hours worth of work, right? Because it would be a ongoing sort of like, you know, 10 week event, essentially, I would then probably adjust my rates because yeah. what I would be counting on is like, I could do it for you cheaper because you are booking me and hiring me for a consistent amount of work. Yeah. So the way it works is like freelance work. You, you're allowed to charge more per hour or per, per project because they don't have the overheads of yeah. leave and all this sort of stuff. You're, they can fire you at the drop of the hat. Um, and for new, like, I haven't quite been able to get a new client do this yet, but for new clients, I'm like 20% deposit. If you cancel within 12 hours, that money is mine. <laughs> like, um, I think that's a good um, strategy yeah. to do. Yeah, uh, and you know, I've, I've got trusted clients that they can pay me post and things like that. So it's for, for a CDW session, like if I was gonna do one of my CDW scribes for, for a one-off event, I'd be like, eh, probably four or $500. Yeah. Um, because the value isn't just, here's a picture, the value you sell is the engagement you have with participants. It's, it becomes a longevity piece. Um, your, your, your notes should be at a quality that if someone was to read it, they would kind of get a sense of the day. You know, they might not have all the answers, but they'd go, oh, they talked about X, Y, and Z, and here's some of the detail. Um, but, you know, I, the way I pitch them is like, often because I'm doing them for workshops, it's like, well, you need to close with your participants and show that you've listened to them and show the contribution they've made to your project. And so the value is that becomes a communication piece. They can put it in, it's a visual piece, so they can put it in reports and social media, like look at this cool thing, but also the engagement of like, we can show our participants, we've listened to them, they can have that piece, share that around. Um, so that's really why you can kind of charge like a bit of money for these sort of things. Um, so I'll give us a sort of a choose your own adventure at the moment. Uh, I can show us a little bit around like, you know, there's a question around layers and how that might structure and do things. So I can jump on Photoshop here and do that. Uh, we can go into a little bit of an activity. If we're getting a bit of like energy, we just want to draw and start pra uh, practicing some of this stuff. Um, or I can talk more about graphic design, which I, can, I will cover regardless at the end of the session because it's so kind of related to where we're at in uni, but also to this sort of work. So. Who has a preference? Hands up for activity. Cool. M most of the middle row. Hands up for uh, demo on layers. <laughs> One for Xander. All right. Let's go. Let's move into an activity, shall we? Um, and what we can do is we can do a couple of activities and we can break it up with some talking and presenting and things like that. So, round one. All right. Uh, what am I going to do this? Okay, I'll leave this here because I can write some notes and do some structures for us. So, you still want to do a demo after? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, we've got time. Like, I'm really flexible. You guys are starting to talk to me now, so it's nice. <laughs> um, so, what I'm going to do is we're going to do, um, I'm going to throw you in the deep end, and we're going to do, I've got three articles, uh, well, condensed versions of articles that I find interesting. I'm going to uh, give you a process of one minute to, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the heading to that article. I'm going to give you, because it's your first time, I'm going to give you some cheap words um, and you are going to have a little bit of time to uh, think about what that topic might be. Do not Google the article, guys, uh, and read it and then plan from that. That is cheating and you will fail this uh, <laughs> seminar. Um, Oh, it is now, and you have a pass or fail uh, grading to this. Can we get high distinctions? You can get high distinctions, but I'll make you work for it. <laughs> Don't forget to, what you want to put in the Discord. No, no, no. Uh, no, no, no. Just like it. Um, so, yeah. Once you're done with your stuff, just put it in the Discord. It should, it, the, the Discord has a session. I'll give you, I'll give you time because I want us I want us to share our work. Yeah. So, um, you know, you might be here because you're like I just want to do it for myself and that's great. Um, but I'm going to try and encourage you guys to sort of share even these really rough first ones to start building your confidence um, because you know if you get good at them you should be strong enough and confident enough to share them with others. Yeah. Um, so the way this is going to work, I'm going to share the heading. I will share some keywords. I will give you three minutes to think about it, plan it, 
uh, develop a visual library, so maybe do a little bit of thinking of what your icons might be. Uh, then I will read you the content, and I will read it however I see fit, whether they be quick, slow, or fast, and you will be recording that. Um, and then we will go, then I'll give you some time, I'll give you one minute to polish that work. Um, I'm gonna make, like, if you're not done, it's okay, like, it's your first go. Um, then you'll have some time to upload it to Discord, and then we'll share it. Uh, you know, I'll, maybe I'll put it on the screen if you're comfortable. Um, and we'll just have a bit of a chat around what people found difficult and what people, and I can provide some advice and some framing that way around how to approach it. <clears throat> so our first article is called, A New Fossil Reveals One of the Largest Mammals Ever Found is a Rhino. That's the heading of it, okay? Some of the cheat words that I'm going to provide to you right now, if I can get this to look good. Yes. What was it called again? A new fossil reveals one of the largest mammals ever found is a rhino. So for this one, oh my god, this feels so unnatural to me. <laughs> So these are words that I have just, that I know are related to the article because I read the article. Uh, and these are some just prompts for you to think about how am I going to represent these words or what do they bring to mind? So, you know, some of these are pretty straightforward. Um, so I'll give you, and I'm going to start timing us now so that we move quickly. You're going to have two or three minutes, depending on how I feel when I get there, to develop a plan. So you're thinking, What's the topic? What, what am I, what, how am I going to visualize something? Um, and potentially even, you know, how might I lay something out? So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. that looks like a good amount of time. <clears throat> So minute and a half left, keep prepping, keep planning. Forty seconds. So what you've just done is you've built yourself a little bit of a cheat sheet. So make sure that that whatever you've just noted down, however you've drawn that, um, is just put it to the side, change your canvas, make sure you've got some space. Um, I would recommend starting maybe somewhere like in the middle of somewhere and that way you've got lots of room either way. But your scribe, your plan, you can do whatever you want. Oh. 
Why is this not the way we want to do? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this. I'll try and be gentle and read it at a slower pace. Uh, what you're listening for are what are those key points? Think about your heading, your point, and your container. Right. That's sort of probably what I'd let get you to get you to do here. So here we go. <clears throat> New fossil reveals one of the largest land mammals ever found, and it's a rhino. A two, uh, two. Okay, you guys can't make fun of me for reading aloud because I'm like terrible at it. <laughs> a two, uh, twenty-six point five million year old skull found in northwest China has been identified as another extinct species of giant rhino, one of the largest mammals to ever roam the land. The fossil is remarkably well preserved, and after close analysis, scientists have named it Paracetherimita linexis, which is completely wrong, but we'll just call it fancy rhino name. The science species of uh, the sixth species of the hornless rhino genus to be uncovered in Eurasia. Compared to other ri uh, giant rhinos. Uh, fossils found, the, new, the newly discovered species has relatively short nose trunk and a long neck with a deep nasal, nasal cavity. Rhino fossil name are a subfamily of the superfamily Rhinoceratosidia, which modern rhinos belong to. For 11 million years, the giant their giant shadow fell upon the earth from far north Mongolia to Pakistan. No one knows what happened to them in the end. All right, I'm gonna give you one minute to, uh, I'll give you two, so that way I'm not being too mean. I'll give you two minutes to uh, finish your scribe. So don't worry about color, just get your line, your heading, your point, your picture, just work it, just get it in a nice layout. Forty seconds. No. I, uh, <laughs> it is also very hard. Like I, I would have had a little bit more time, but like. <laughs> <laughs> Ten seconds. <laughs> uh, pens down, guys. <laughs> Who I, I reckon take a screenshot. Uh, and upload it to Discord. <laughs> it's fine if there's like nothing there, guys. No one died in our right on one side of mine. Did you not Google a rhino? I told you to Google one. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, there was no time. There's there was no, no time. time. There's no time. No, um, I, these, they, these tasks, are, I, I've designed them to be very challenging because are mean, but they are just like yeah. lots of fun. Thank so, you so much. <laughs> um, is this in yeah, I just put in session work. I'll bring it up onto this screen for us. 
Squad, hello. Yes, loving it. Oh my god. Really? Yep, good class story. All right, cool. Uh, I, I'll go through each of these and sort of share what's kind of like what's really great and exciting about each of them. Um, but before I, what I'll do is I'll bring this one up. I mean, I know it's on the side, but we can sort of deal with that. Um, Scully. Who's Scully? Lucy. <laughs> Lucy in disguise down the back there. And I, I open the original that is on the bottom. No, 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 open it. And then it says open original. I'll just put it on the desk. And then, um, there we go. All right. How did you How did you find this task? Uh, well, I think I got so caught up in like writing down everything you were saying that I, I didn't keep up with what you were doing. So like, I stopped momentarily and was like, oh wait, I didn't realize what you said before. That was a crucial piece of information, but I didn't go back to it. So yeah, but the. Yeah, <laughs> listening and that sort of forward, always listening and that deep listening, right? And I do sometimes fall into that trap of like, oh shit, I've, I've got caught up and what the fuck did they just say, <laughs> right? And you just move on. You're just like, you know, you might, if it's really important, someone will come over and tell you to add it. I think also like the thing that CDW is, has the safety net always being recorded. Mm. So it's like, oh, I think you need to write everything down. It's recorded. <laughs> But what I like about this one, um, and I can already see you doing, is you've got some very clear clustering going on. So you've got sort of three cl uh, columns I can see you've naturally tried to build out. Um, and you're already thinking, you know, we've got some, you've got a nice little heading treatment with an underline here um, and a good little pull out here. Uh, I'm glad that you got the last line, which no one knows what happens to them, because that's the ending statement. Um, that, that ends, that really punctuates not only the article that I read you, but your live scribe, it's the full stop. Um, so I'm really pleased to see that was there. And um, I love your little rhino in the corner here. <laughs> um, what, did, you, what, did you look at anything before you started? Uh, no, I didn't use any reference to the rhino. Yeah. Um, so I just, I would have Googled a rhino. <laughs> it's the first thing I would have Googled. But again, I only gave you a minute to prep, so it either needed or there. I was kind of, I think most people were just, like how they're going to set up your document um, mm. and then they Google it after. Yeah. So preparation in the graphic is the, the visual representation. It's the reference gathering. So whose is this lovely little bit of work? Oh, yay. How'd you find it? Oh. I really feel for you. Uh, like, so I have a sort of similar thing, uh, not officially dyslexic, but like kind of getting there. Um, so I've always felt really self conscious about my spelling. There's a reason I draw and don't write novels. Um, but it, it's, what I do is when I do that sort of thing, is I actually have my phone on hand or, you know, if I'm at the computer, and I'll just have Google open and just like slam a word in there and spell it that way. Um, just some methods for people. That I do, um, I, I do it digitally now. So I actually have um, either I get one of my workmates or I have someone that I employ. Uh, like you know, I chuck them some money and they do it for me. Uh, they I get them to proofread, and then because it's digital, I can go back and then edit that. Um, so because I know spelling is a weak point of mine, all my clients have a single round of feedback um, that I just action for them, and it's up to them. And I work with them, and I'm transparent enough to say like. I have this process because it is a weakness, so that's how we work through it. Um, <clears throat> again, I love that you've got a little like magnifying glass going on here, and you've got that two different colours, so that way you can really see, um, you know, those two messages. They had a different look: a short nose and a long neck. Like you picked up some of those key descriptors and those key words, and those are the things you would look to signpost. So I really like that. Uh, was there anything you had fun doing? Uh, just like. 
I was planning to do a rhino in the middle, but it's kind of like upwards. Like, okay, here's a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that's, again, that's really good. When there's empty space, and when you'll see them in my scribes, it's when I go and draw something. I draw a little rhino, draw a little related tree or topic to it, and fill it up. Um, that sort of thing. Dana! How'd you find it? <laughs> I think everyone found it difficult. Well, I wrote down everything to say. Oh, yeah. I'll write a Hmm. No, that's all good. And like that's the thing, right? Like as I said, sometimes you just got to get those notes in. You can come back and fill the graphics in later when they take five minutes to take a coffee break or something, or when someone starts. People will inevitably waffle, and you'll just be like, "Great, like you'd go on and talk, and I'm just going to work on this because I know you're not bringing any new content to the the page." Um, but uh, love the you know you, you've got a really strong graphic style there, um, and you've got clear layers your one two three which fits with that story that i had of the the graphic and i love you got a little 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 container my gosh love containers sam is sam here yes. oh sorry sam <laughs> i'm still learning everyone's names uh how did you was what did you find particularly challenging or anything you found really fun nah you're just like oh, i don't want to do this <laughs> Yeah, if you're tired, it will be very difficult. But um, again, same sort of thing. You're really starting to bring in those headings, containers, um, and love the color there. Um, you've even like, you've even got a cluster here on location. Yeah, no, no one did. But in in the five minutes that we did that thing, like there was there was no time to do anything, which is why I tried to design it that way. <laughs> uh, Cassie. Oh my god, I'm not. Oh. <gasps> Look at this cute little rhino! Oh, I didn't even know what a rhino looked like. That is so cute. <laughs> I just knew a rhino had a big horn and I was like, okay, and it looks like a hippo, yeah, okay, good. Because <laughs> that's what rhinos are, just really horns. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I want to really call out Cassie here. She's um, definitely done her planning well. She's got a title, a heading, a point, and a container, um, which she has definitely executed here. I tried to, like, do it. I, I, I tried to, like, as much points as you could, like when it came to the graphic side, but mm. when, it come, when it comes to like information, I'm just like, uh, key, keywords, yep, got it, okay. Yeah, and you, I gave you some keywords to start with, and that's what you're listening for, right? I, I didn't tell you there was going to be like a time or a date, I just wrote years, um, and you know, you've kind of got that there, like you know, 2000 to 2011. Yeah, I, I wanted to do the, the calendar that you had, but I was like, oh, I don't want to copy it, so I'll just do my own thing. <laughs> Jordan? Sorry, I'm still learning name, guys. I'm, I'm really bad. <laughs> oh, look, you've even got the, the variation there in the description. Um, you know, long neck, no nose to a short, stubby guy. Uh, did you find anything fun or particularly challenging that we haven't quite covered yet? Well, I mean, like, I like, I like the fact that, you know, with the text, you can put, put into, like, any image that you want that reminds you of that text. That was fun. It was more the time constraint that I was like, oh, oh, God, I've just written down all these things. Oh, I don't have time to put that all down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's good. That's all of them there. <clears throat> um, when you're dealing with like subjects that you're not really familiar with, how do you discern what's important and what's not? Yeah. Um, a bit of practice in understanding how people present. Um, you know, pe people when they're presenting information will start with. Um, well, I'll just leave it there. That's fine. Um, people will start with um, the point they want to talk about. They'll explain that point or whatever evidence they want to provide to that, and then they'll close it with a, a reminding statement. You know, uh, when I'm really not familiar, so like I, when I did that additive manufacturing live scribe, which was literally like manufacturing metal and like adding shit to it and like lasers and all this shit, and I was sitting there going like, fuck. Um, the good thing was that we actually ran that event, so I was able to have, um, I'd sure I get like an agenda. I try to get keynote um, bios so that at least then I can like read about like what their exp expertise is. I might I would have done a little bit of research to understand what the hell the phrase additive manufacturing meant, um, and then I would have googled um, started googling, you know, I would have started with some just some inspiration for some graphic live scribe in science like iconography because um, I knew it would be science based. I would have googled additive manufacturing and seen real life what 
that kind of looks like and there was like I think there was like a pretty clear like laser graph or something so I like banked that because I figured that would come up um, and I just listen if it sounds like that's a key title a name of something or like people like asking questions about it it's like that is interesting to the audience in which I'm creating this for so I'm just gonna go with the flow and trust trust myself enough to kind of like put together the puzzle right I might not know what that means but I know that it's important enough to put on a page um, and if you're really unsure talk with your client like you'll be talk with the person you're doing it for and be like okay like how would you explain this to myself who has no experience in it uh, you ask a scientist to do that they will go on for 10 minutes about shit that does not make any sense um, so yeah so you just have to be like okay what I'm hearing is it means X, Y, and Z. Try and keep it simple language, because if you can, if you can distill it into simple language, the icon and the the stuff will relate to that. Um, and then they'll say, "Ah, oh, yeah, you've got it," or like, "Ah, oh, no, it's a little bit more like that." So, um, just trust yourselves. You'll have those conversations. Do research. It's it's, it's not as daunting as it really sounds. <coughs> Any more questions, sort of, from that experience? No. Let's do it again! Oh, yay. I've got three articles, so we could do this a couple more times. I'll give you a bit more time now. I won't be mean. Yeah, and you know, I don't want to discourage you guys. So, like, she's making us make rubbish, right? Um, no, I will. I'll, I will give you a little bit more time. I'll give. How about I give you three to four minutes to plan? A little bit of googling. Get, get some icons, thumbs up. Google. <laughs> <laughs> Open Google if you haven't already. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I might wander around so you can ask me some questions specific to your prep and planning. <clears throat> so, uh, as, as always, I'll, I'll give you the headline, I'll give you some keywords, and then I will give us some time. So, mm, let's do the colossal black hole. Um, I quite like science, so these are all science. Uh, <laughs> I don't like science, I like headliners, but uh, here we go. So a colossal, black hole, uh, a, a colossal black hole storm has been detected raging in the early universe. Yep. So the colossal black hole storm, that's like sort of like one word. I don't think it's technically one word, but it's whatever. Uh, has been detected. Oh, is that all? No, I'm running that up here oh, for us. Okay, detected uh, raging in the early universe. So that's a really descriptive title. You can already start pulling keywords off that. But I will also add to the list. There's some keywords around years and time. Wind came up. Uh, there's some. Would you like simplify the, the title, or would you um, like set the whole title here, like normally? So, because if you imagine the title as the name of the event. Uh, you would use whatever name of the thing you're doing, right? Um, this is an article, so the, 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 the like long is really long, but like most events name, again, drawing back to that symposium, it's like the Additive Ma Manufacturing uh, Workshop and Symposium. That was the name of that event, so that was the name that went across the title, uh, was, was the title of the live scribe. Um, you know, events, um, graphic recordings should always have a title, uh, a date, if relevant, um, your name, and the name of the uh, the person hosting the client and speakers. So, like, you know, there's there's key information that you could have. Um, so we have years, wind. There's, uh, I've got the word comparison here, clue, studying. There should be a Y in there somewhere, but I don't care. Uh, and then there's a list. <clears throat> All right. So I'll give us four minutes to do some planning. Uh, some Googling, uh, you know, getting our head around what do these words mean and how will I show them. Um, and I will stand here and if you want me to come over and talk to you about something.
Graphic scribe, graphic recording, or live scribe. I like graphic recording because yeah. it makes sense in my head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help, but I'm going to feel free to nix things off my list as well. Two and a half minutes left. minute and a half. So I do my I do my live scribes in two ways. I do them live and I do what I call a post recording. So like when I'm provided a recording, I hate doing them post recorded because for some reason I just cannot like even if the recording's two hours, I can't get it. Like it takes me four hours to listen to the recording. Like because I keep stopping and pausing and right, I get yeah. stuck in the detail because I have the luxury of time. Right. Um, so they they're they're getting more and more common. So I'm really trying to like create the pressures of a live event uh, to like just save my sanity because uh, you know, the nature of freelance work is if you go over your sort of quote, you kind of have to just bear the, the overrun, right? I don't want to be working for free essentially. Um, but so I prefer, I definitely prefer live. Live just, there's, there's something about a live recording that just keeps me to, oops, keeps me to time, uh, you know, gets done when it's supposed to be done. It's not supposed to be the be all or end all of the Mona Lisa, right? It's, yeah. it's a documenting, a, a, a thing of time. So I don't want to spend ages on it. <clears throat> um, and I like doing, I, I do say I, I much prefer, um, I do have a lot more fun with my personal scribes because then I, I get permission to like experiment. Like my, uh, if you're interested, I can take, I can show you the, like the, the collection I have for uh, this semester and you can kind of see where I start like you know you'll see an increase in skill but you'll also see like where I can start just having a bit more fun and experimenting with different ways of representing and color and all the things that have fun so like um that might be worth showing I think um all right guys that timer was telling me that y'all need are ready to listen to this article again so uh while I'm pulling this up just make sure you've got space uh, and give me the thumbs up when your canvas is ready. And if you don't, I'll just pick a time in 10 seconds. <laughs> <coughs>
five, four, three, two, one. All right. A colossal black hole storm has been detected raging in the early universe. In the far reaches of the universe, a supermassive black hole is throwing a tantrum. It's blowing a tremendous wind into intergalactic space, and we're seeing the storm light from 13.1 uh, billion years ago when the universe was less than 10% of its current age. It's the most distant, uh, the most distant such tempest we've ever identified and its discovery is a clue that could help astronomers unravel the history of gal galaxy information, uh, galaxy formation, sorry, not information. This makes it the earliest black hole wind identified to date, extending the record by 100 million years, suggestive that feedback emerged relatively early in the history of the universe. That is a good example of a sentence that makes no sense. <coughs> That's not the only thing that emerged early, however. Measurements show that the supermassive black hole clocks in at around 330 million times the mass of the sun. Why do we care? This is an important question uh, because it is related to the important, uh, the important problem in astronomy. How did galaxies and supermassive black holes co-evolve? By studying the LMA data, researchers were able to measure the mass of J1243 plus 0100's bulge. It clocks in at 30, times billion, uh, 30 billion times the mass of the sun, making the black hole's mass proportional at roughly 10% of that of the bulge. <laughs> bulge. Uh, this suggests that the co-evolution of the supermassive black holes and their host galaxies has also been occurring since the la at least a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. <clears throat> uh, that was me to me. That was a hard article. <laughs> I will give you five minutes. Does that sound like a good enough time? Yeah, yeah. I'll give you five minutes to, to sort of polish up. Three and a half minutes. I've got a cord here.
All right, one more minute left. <clears throat> if you haven't finished, uh, if you've finished your lines, uh, I would suggest maybe chuck in some color, create a new layer and chuck it behind it. Pick one and just slap it on. to Discord. Holy shit, Sam. <laughs> that looked great. Hey Sam, do you want to kick us off with how'd you find that second round go? <laughs> that is such a clever trick. Mm. Oh, that's really cool. Like, uh, it's kind of, kind of impressive that you've been able to like switch between typing and drawing. Um, yeah. <laughs> Whole process. Yeah, but even but even being able to switch between just like the the act of physically typing and drawing is is uh, interesting because it's something that's just it, it doesn't compute my brain quite well. Um, was there anything you'd like to share further, or are you just like looks good? <laughs> no, all good. Lucy, ha, ah! love this. How'd you go? A little bit better. I need to work on my handwriting, I think. And um, just like dummy call these things and letting all of it down so it's just more organized. Mm. Um, you've done a classic uh, graphic, well, something that I've sort of started doing now that I'm in digital form is doing a really fancy background mm -hmm. and then just having some really simple containers as the uh, sort of content. And that's. Um, that's quite a strong style that's sort of coming out about because um, that's something you can you can do pre-draw like sometimes I do pre-draw little things like I'll do the, the headings and all the stuff before um, you know the frame stuff that's that stack frame I mentioned before I might do all that before the session even kicks off or the day before um, so you could definitely apply the same sort of principles of doing a, a kind of ornate background with simple containers and some representation with those um, so I liked it you guys have all just like gone even better. Um, Shiana? Yeah. How'd you go? <laughs> no, I, I love it. You've got that big heading piece um, and then with the, the three points around the side. That's very common in my work. I'll often just be like center frame a heading um, and then have those tendrils or connecting things that sit around it. Um, you've got lots of perspective going on in here. like. You know these these things here on on perspective. Oh, yeah. And the, the type as well. Yeah, um, but you've got some really good stuff coming in here. I like that you've also been using what appears to be sort of a pencil esque brush um, that adds really lovely texture um, to it. <laughs> it's really fun. The only thing that I would say that would really improve, like you know, without going back and redoing anything, but like the only thing that would really help uh, this uh, is just getting to. Um, 
and it's just because you've run out of space in your or you've cropped it really close to what you've drawn but having a little bit of white space between you know here um, and here like this this sits really comfortably like it looks like a cluster it hasn't anything really jammed next to it whereas you know where these are, are getting a bit tight um, so a bit of white space is always your friend when you're graphic recording <laughs> All right. Does anyone else want to share or? Yeah, I'm yeah no, no worries. I'll I'll leave it up. Uh, I'll clean it up. She gone the wrong. She gone the long way. Yeah, I the best, but you know, I got everything that you know was key. What the thing was, was that um, oh, I was choosing colors and I was doing the background. I'm like, ah, uh, quick, just, yeah, not a, not a color bar. But um, uh, graphics for me were secondary. Mm -hmm. I was trying to um, prioritize like, the, the yeah, information. Prioritize the... Looking at it, you got all the points, right? Like, or at least the start of the points. Like, I wouldn't say galaxy formation is a point because it doesn't stand on its own. So when you're making bullet points and things like that, you need to be able to read it and be like, um, you know, the comparison is saying like, I think the article was like, it gives clues to the galaxy formation or something. Yeah. Like that's what you would look to bullet point. But yeah. um, you, 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 you did the same sort of approach that I do when things get quick, right? It's yeah. like, get those content in because I can draw on top of it, but I can't get them to repeat what they've said. Mm. Um, and you know, yes, your colors are fucked, but like at least you're thinking in color. You've got, yeah. you know, different headings, uh, and you've got that one, two, three coming through in your colors quite well. So, I wanted to like show that I like the differences between the headings and the title and the yeah, okay. and that comes through, right? Exactly. Uh, Jordan, how'd you go? Um, better. You know, there's always time constraints and things in there. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love this little overlay over here. Um, it's maybe something you've noticed in my work as well, but I, I, creating layers and depth is always, creates visual interest is essentially what you're trying to do. It's like, how do I, how do I make this little point look fun, something you want to read? And I, layering is a really good way to do that. Um, and I love the magnifying glass in the corner. Like, it's definitely where it's done. Ah, oh, Xander, wow. Got some icons. Yep. Okay, so you can leave. You're going to steal my job, so I don't want that. Um, how'd you go? Yeah. Time? Yep. Yeah. It's going to be the most common point, right? It's like, I just want more time. Um, and you just get quicker and better at it. Uh, but I love, again, you've got some tight treatment in here going. Um, really lovely iconography. I often use little icons as my bullet point because it's like, ah. Oh, it's a bullet point and I've drawn something, yeah. that's great. Um, and you're really like, you know, you've got the time and 10% of the universe related. Like this is re like furthest in an IP, so that's a related concept. Measurement, uh, three billions times the mass, you're measuring that. So this were, like this is pretty impressive to sort of see this come through so quickly. Um, so well done. And everyone, I don't want to say just single Xander out, like everyone like has leveled up in like 10 seconds so quickly. <laughs> Uh, so any other questions or anything like as you've sort of been practicing in these past two rounds that you'd like me to chuck my two cents on? No? Like, what do you think the ratio should be between like these graphics, like 30% graphics, 30% like animation, or? Oh, you're going to hate because it's like, depends. <laughs> uh, it depends. Repeat the question. Oh uh, yeah. For those online, the question was, uh, how? What's the ratio of graphics? So like, how? What should you be aiming for? Like, thirty percent graphic or seventy percent text? I think that's a pretty flat. Like, that's a pretty good. That's a bit text heavy, but like, that's a good ratio as a principle. Um, when I first started, like, oh, I was a bit like, and my stuff is still very text heavy, and it's because of the context in which I work my graphic live scribing. Um, so. I do some graphic recording for research, design research. So it's like we need a lot of the information that I capture is sort of the notes that we take forward into other parts of the work. So in those sort of situations where it's um, more of a research piece and, I, and, I, and we need the content and whether that be 
um, you know, for, for research or for say like, lots of governments like to host a workshop and then what they, they get people to do is they come together, share some ideas, make some priorities, um, and then that like co-goes into a report. Um, if it was like an idea generation, I'd be sure I'm getting those content down. But, um, so they tend to be a bit more text heavy because I'm trying to really ensure that I am getting all the detail. Um, but for like events and presentations and things that, like that, I try to really push the graphic element of it um, and write, really try to get some of that visual treatment in there and that, that funness that people like in graphic recording. I think as a general rule, you know, 60, 40, like 60% text, 40% visual. So I know I just changed those numbers, but like I think that's probably what you'll probably be aiming for. And then when you get quicker and better, you'll find that you naturally start using less text because you're able to synthesize those key points quicker. You're able to do more visuals because you've got, you start practicing and know how to draw these things really quickly and really rapidly. So you, you start getting that confidence and that speed to be able to really push into a little bit more of the more visual side of the notes. Um, and yeah, I think um, that's sort of my thoughts on that. I, a general a, a thing is like you're there to make a visual visual product. So just try and be as visual as you can at all times. But don't be afraid of text. Like it's it's, it's symbiotic. Like it, it's related. Uh, next question. Next questions. How would you go about the color theory? I know you were just talking about it. Yeah. <clears throat> so let me break down. Like let's just use one of my graphic scribes, and I'll just sort of break down sort of what what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about when I do it. I think that's probably just the easiest way for me to to talk to you about it. Otherwise, like, I'll just waffle on about, like, I'll be too busy trying to, like, oh, I'm pretty sure that's the right word. So colour theory is, for me, definitely about contrast. Um, so when, when you're with any design or any graphic design, it's always about legibility, right? Your color theory, what it does to artworks is it either like draws the, like I use color to draw the eye or to um, like, you know, create like bounding boxes and things like that. And when you're, when you're doing designs, it's all about where do I want the eye to look first? And that might be about creating contrast in your colors, um, you know, and, positioning and all that sort of stuff. So like when I look at this one, right, I knew that, you know, I was given the logo for the Food Systems Summit in 2021, and I knew that green was immediately going to be an established color for me. That is my heading titles because it's in the goddamn logo. It's strong enough that it's uh, it can hold its own against a, a slightly different background. Um, and it's a nice enough shade that it goes with other colors, right? <laughs> Um, and I, having that green is what I built the scribe, the, the scribe color pa palette around essentially. Um, so I always like that and I have a green color. I, I always use yellow. I love yellow. I think it's a really powerful color because when you up up the, up the contrast um, and give it enough like, you know, it's not pale, you give it enough color, um, it becomes uh, saturation. Thank you. This is why I don't like talking about color theory. It's like I know it, but I just cannot use the words for it. Um, it it gives it like really vibrance. It's lots of energy. Like it's a it's a happy, warm color. Um, but then when you pair it back, it becomes a really beautiful, like soft shade shaded color. So um, I knew I wanted uh, a green. I always had sort of a color for secondary subheadings and things like that. I want to hide, uh, cut, and then I build. Um, some shadings around that. So this is a very monochromatic sort of scribe, I would say. Like it's all built around that green color with one contrasting color to make sure that I can pop things when I need to. Um, and that's you know definitely in the bottom half of that conversation where they were thinking about ideas. And I do so many light bulbs, guys. You want to do this work? Learn how to draw light bulbs. Fucking every time someone says ideas, you're like, Fuck, another light bulb. Um, <laughs> Another one. Yeah, well, this one, like when you look down at this one, right? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight light bulbs, and they're different. They're not all different, but they are different shapes and sizes and stuff. So, yep. Yeah. How much creative freedom do you find? Have you ever had a client who like looks at what you made and goes, "I don't like the colors on that, or I want to do it differently"? Yeah. Uh, 
No, because I manage that conversation. So when I go into a com uh, into any client work sort of things, they've seen my work. I have examples, um, and the thing I talk about is that like I would consider myself like a, a colourful live scriber. Like people, because I work digitally, and lots of people are now pushing into that space. But like, if you look sort of more at some of the previous stuff, say ten years ago, or things like that, or even recently, like there's people tend to sort of have a very limited color palette. It's not about like having every color on the rainbow. It's like a really strong black, some couple of pop colors and some shades of those colors, right? Um, sorry, I forgot the question. I totally got on a tangent. What are you asking me again? Uh, branding and branding and setting up. Yep. Yeah, so um, when I do these sort of things, I, I go into that conversation. I go, look, do you have any branding or color requirements, right? Like I when you see my scribes all sit together, they all look the same because it's all done by me, but there's some key colors I actually commonly use. So I use a dark purple as instead of a black um, because I think it just, I think it's, I think it looks nicer. Like when you look at this, this one here, like that's not black. Yeah, I think it's like drawing when you're doing um, like line art yeah. or graphic design. It's like the, the one, one of the number one things they say is don't draw on black. Don't draw on black, yeah. And I come from like a line art, manga art background. I was definitely that eight year old kid, like super into Inuyasha. Like, I oh loved God, it. Yes. Um, and, you know, so that's sort of like, I've been on this journey for a while now. So, <laughs> um, so you know, I, I, I like all these scribes, are, these are my favorite colors to use. I like using yellows and pinks. I think they look good on the screen. I think they print well. Um, and I use it in a way, like you can see, I've got sort of shades of the color. So that pink is sort of, it's not an exact shade of that purple, but like they, they're complementary. Um, that Those yellows, they're the sort of same shades and build that sort of thing. Um, so I have a brand that I sort of use for my graphic scribing, but I always sense check with the client. What are, you, what are your requirements for the visual? And it's often, give me your logos, where do they sit? They'll, um, because I'm a designer, they just give me a, a branding guideline and I know how to read those and like use those. Um, and you know, I, I, go, I go find that logo of the company and I'll probably use the logo of the company as that main key color, like I did with the green scribe. Um, you know, it's, it's a safe bet that they're not gonna be mad about that. But I always add in extra colors. I'm a colorful person, I love color. I'll add that in and you know if you're someone who doesn't love color and you like more monochromatic like really dramatic just shades of the same color is also a really powerful um, can be a really powerful visual uh, you know you just you'll figure it out <laughs> um, so uh, have we gone through everything there's no tabs through my slides make sure I've gone all the way through let's take a break we've got some practicing we've been talking about all this sort of stuff uh, tips and tricks, uh, so practice, clustering, have fun. If you're not enjoying doing this sort of note taking and you just want to go sit there and listen and that's how you absorb information, then do it that way. Like I, I've just turned this into a job because it's the way I think and do and people pay me good money to do it. Um, you're listening for those key points. Start with basic shapes. Oh, this is something I should have touched on ages ago. Um, you know, you, you're, you're going to be tempted to sort of run before you can walk. Uh, so make sure you can like draw a square, uh, you can draw a tree, just start with circles and hearts and things like that. So like just start with the simple stuff and then build it up. <laughs> exactly! Like black holes are like scary as shit but we like that cool. <laughs> Gotta send them some love. Cassie? Do you ever get clients who be like, hey can you design me a logo? You're a graphic designer, design me a logo. You could not pay me money to design a logo. They are the fucking worst. Um, I once designed, like, I think I tried, like, my mum gets free graphic design from me for life because she birthed me. But, um, so I've done her logo and things like that. And, her, and she is, like, the most, like, least painful client. And even then I was like, it is too tedious. Um, so, like, I know what I like to work on and what I don't like to work on. I hate working on logos. You cannot pay me to do it, and therefore I will not do it for you. Um, unless it's like, like I do my stuff because it's yeah. for me, it's like fun, right? Um, so I, I have a, an interesting set of skill sets and sort of um, why I kind of get to do a little bit of this work is sort of the, the way in which my career has evolved. Um, so like I, I wouldn't, like I don't really describe myself as like, I, I use the term graphic designer when I want people not to ask me about what I do. Like it's like an accountant. 
it's that level of like I don't I don't want to talk about this. I'm a graphic designer. That's what I do, yeah. and it is like I, I I come from that background. It's what I apply to my work, um, but I don't do graphic design. Like I do information design. Yeah. So I do like like long format. Uh, navigation pieces for documents and complex visualization. So I can talk more about that, but it makes me sound really egotistical, so I don't like talking about it. Um, <coughs> uh, that might be the next activity if we're having fun. Uh, well, I mean, again, I'm going to choose your own adventure again. Uh, we can do one more of those sort of article uh, thingies. Uh, everyone's nodding furiously, so I think maybe we'll go down that way. Um, I'll show you, then I'll maybe I'll quickly do, actually what I'll do before that, I'll just quickly show you how I set, I'll use Photoshop because it's the same sort of principles, but I'll quickly show you how I set up my documents. Um, it's, I think it's minimized here. Oh, yeah, like window, yeah, yeah, I hate this. I'm, I'm in purgatory right now. Yeah. Alright, cool, here we go. So say, like, say that that's a new document. I've just hit new, I have my template ready size. First thing I do is this. I take a million layers because like, I am the person that is perpetually always drawing on that layer. So I've just built a habit that just like, get some layers in your document. Uh, so the first thing it would be, this is your frame layer. I would label it. Do you always label it? Yeah. <clears throat> you don't want to be drawing on this layer. Like if you need to like move your logos and stuff around. Um, and the reason why I do that is because like I've just run into shit where the logo has been on a weird layer and I've just, it just turns into a real big pain. Um, so like, you know, what I'll do is I'll make sure I've got my content on the bottom here. So that's like my byline logos and things like that in my, uh, in this sort of example here, <clears throat> like these, like I've got that there, I have this as a static piece of inf information that I just like, I, I do that on another layer, a separate layer, like the titles and stuff. But this way, like the design of, I mean, the design is so simple. It's like a, a heading line and a bottom line. But that way, you know, through all of them, they are all in the same spot. They don't move, they're just static. Um, so, you know, you might have a little logo up here, and a guy up here. Hello. Um, and then I lock this guy. I don't want to touch him, because that's going to stay static. And whatever I make has to fit within this parameter anyway. Um, so then I'll go to the top layer and I call this guy lines. <clears throat> and that's where I'll start drawing my things. Um, and then I'm just using the mouse. I, can't, I don't know where I put the pens. I was just there, but oh, okay. it's because I'm going back and forth to the hand thingy. I just, oh, I think no, it's yeah. easy. No, no, it's funny. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like back back when I was like 12 and I was saving yeah, up for my like webcom. So I'm like, Sitting there like, and then I I use shadow, shade, color, whatever. I'll line that guy up, and I'll just pick this color. Hello. This is also a really nice blue. For, like that sort of shade is a really nice blue for graphic scribing. I find. Right, and then you go. Oh shit. What if I need to move this smiley this smiley guy? Right. I've done a whole bunch of work. He's in the wrong position. He's in my way. Now, I'm going to see if I can do it in this one. I know how to do it in Procreate, but most apps will let you select both layers. You can use a lasso tool. So it's your move tool. And see, like, now I can just move this guy wherever I want. Uh, the other power benefit, so that's, like, I try not to do color too early. So I do try to shade sort of, you know, I'll, I'll get a quarter of the way in, get line work down, get a bit of a structure and know where things are going to start shaping up. And once I kind of know things shouldn't be moving too drastically, that's when I start shading. Because when, when you start working across two layers like this, um, it gets a little frustrating to like sort of size things. So like, you know what I was saying before, what I'll do is I'll now then sort of just toggle. I try to keep a layer between these because on the occasion I have merged my line and my color layer and then someone has said, can you fix that spelling? And I've had to like do some like magic gizmo stuff to like make that work. Um, but that's mainly why I keep my color and layer uh, line separate so that it's easier for me to edit. But as I'm working, right, I will just start making new layers. Like if I know I'm moving on to a new point, um, I can just go like, you know, new point. 
uh, you know, they said x, y, z. Draw my little box. Draw some little pins. And I'm like, oh, creep, I need to move that guy. Because he's on his own new layer now, I can just move him wherever I want. And then when I'm happy, I'm like, oh, yes, great. He sits and I can do this. I also do this a lot. Uh, if I've done something in a strange color that I don't like anymore, I'll just change it. Um, and then I'll just merge that all down. Uh, so I'm going to go Control E, little Command E, Command E, and now it's all in one layer. And Photoshop does the right thing. It keeps the, the, the layer name. But if I know that the layer name has gone askew, I do always try to make sure I know at least where my layers are and clean them and I'll try and clean them as I go because um, I have layer limits and stuff in Procreate that I know about. Um, I think Photoshop is unlimited so you can have as many as you want. Um, and you know, I'll even start like, you know, I potentially, if I've got like a couple of frame layers, sometimes I try and keep logos separate or stuff like that. I use group grouping a lot so I can just navigate it. So you'll build yourself your own sort of process, but predominantly um, straight away, line layer, color layer, um, and a new layer is sort of like what I, because then I build on the new layer and build it and merge it into a line layer. So I know that's really technical, a little bit sort of bland, but I figured, you know, a bit of structure and help with the layers might be helpful for the final round of I get to read you a very complicated science article and you guys get to draw it. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, because... Well, yeah, my brain hurts, but also it's like, if I'm going to read, like, if I have to read an article, I want to read about dinosaurs. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> um, but I've practiced, like, I practice in strange ways, guys. Like, I practice in, like, listening to TED Talks. I practice, like, even when I was, and I do it now, and I think it's just a habit that I've built from early years, is that, like, I used to watch a lot of TV and draw, so like I would be listening to the dialogue but drawing something completely different. So I got into the habit of being able to understand without looking at things. Um, and, you know, on the occasion I've drawn like a movie, like like I'm like, oh, this person said something kind of funky and I'll draw that scene or something. What's the best way to like, practice? I'll cover that in a, in oh, a bit, okay. so I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll park that question. But uh, yeah, so let's um, let's get some going. But if you, uh, <clears throat> I guess we could do article. We could do article. Like I've got one more article prepped. We could do, um, or I could pair you up and you could do stories for each other. So like, if, if you want to talk to someone, but are you guys feeling like you want to talk to someone, or you just want to listen to some science? <laughs> no, I, I saw a couple of heads shake all around us. So I know you're fine, but other people are like, please don't make me talk to people. Well, we'll do that, post that, and people who don't want to talk to each other can just do their own thing. Um, let's do science. Uh, I just pick science because it's, it's, it's fun, it's challenging. It's, it's like all like informational. It's very informational. Pretty, like, practice or <laughs> all right, our new heading is Bizarre Deep Sea Creature Bristling With Teeth is Totally Unique Science Says. Please write that. <laughs> um. Oh god, oh, I hate this, I hate this, it's not my procreate. Yeah, no, um, thanks for coming along. And thank you so much for coming along. Yeah, yeah come yeah. come say hi to me if you ever want to talk graphic recording and have fun at work. <laughs> now, teeth. I always want to spell T H E E T H. Turns out it only has one H, guys. So uh, it's totally bizarre. Uh, totally unique. Sorry. Um, Scientist says, again, this is a really bad heading, but oh well. If you want to crunch this down into a more snappier piece, 
feel free to because that's what you get like that's just good practice to condense so um, cheat words are for this one from the title can anyone tell me what you might want to pull out from there sea creatures sea creatures teeth were also on my list uh, teeth I still want to spell it with a ten H. Yeah, deep sea creatures. So that also narrows in the field of, um, you know, style. Deep sea creatures are creepy as fuck. They're not like cute little fishies. Uh, I have on here as well. Uh, you could though, right? Like sea creatures, deep sea creatures. They're the, they're they're the same sort of oce oceanic, right? Microscopic. That looks like one. Um, sea mounts. All right, there we go. So we've got uh, the words that I have given you, uh, deep sea creatures, teeth, microscopic, sea mounts, and governments, plus the title. I will give you, again, I'll give you some, some time. I'll give you five minutes to prep. We'll do it, and then I'll give you a couple more minutes to refine. Start in now. <coughs> How are we doing for time? Ten. Exactly where I want to be. Three minutes. I will give a clue that there is one word in this, uh, in what, there's, there's a word up on that screen that you should Google. And if, I'm not going to tell you which word it is, but if you haven't Google, like, there's a word you should Google. <laughs> I'm going to just Google the one where I don't know what it is. <laughs> No one give it. No one give away the answer if you know it, because I've got a. There's gonna be a pass fail. We'd be like, which which word did you Google? <laughs> Um, 
It says scientist says, but there's no what says there. But yeah, it says scientist. Oh. It's got an extra s at the bottom. It's supposed to be singular. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, one minute left. Ten seconds. Make sure you've got enough space. All righty, here we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk about deep, bizarre deep sea creature bristling with teeth is totally unique. So the scientist says. Let me introduce you to Ophinajora, a bizarre deep sea animal found in 2011 by scientists from the French Natural, uh, Natural History Museum. While trawling the summit of a secluded seamount called Bank Durin, 500 metres below the waves and 200 kilometres east of New Caledonia in the southwest Pacific Ocean. Ophinajora is the type of bristling star which are distinct cousins of the starfish with snake-like arms radiating from their bodies that live on sea floors around the globe. Being an expert in deep sea animals, I knew at a glance that this one was special when I first saw it in 2015. The eight arms, each 10 centimetres, 10 centimetres long, are armed with rows of hooks and spines. And the teeth! A microscopic scan reveals bristling rows of sharp teeth lining every jaw, which I reckon are used to snare and shred its prey. Seamounts are special places in the, in the deep sea world. Currents swirl around them, bringing nutrition from the depths of trackling plankton from above, which feeds the growth of the spectacular fan corals, sea whips and glass sponges. These in turn host numerous other deep sea animals, but these fascinating communities are vulnerable to human activities such as deep sea trawling and mining for precious minerals. The Australian government recently announced a process to create a new marine parks in the Christian and Couscous regions. Uh, our voyage will provide the data required to manage these parks into the future. The new Caledonian government has also created a marine park in offshore areas of these islands, including the Duran Seamount. These marine parks are beacons of progress in the global uh, drive for better environmental stewardship of our oceans, who know what weird and wonderful treasures are yet to be discovered. I will set a timer for five minutes.
three and a half minutes. One and a half minutes. Upload away. <clears throat> so what we'll do is we'll spend a, a couple more minutes just sharing, asking questions, and then I'll run over some graphic design stuff because it'll sort of tie a little bit of this together, um, as well as you know, there's some there's some handy things that you might be interested in to know about that. Um, and then that should take us to three o'clock. And I'm probably going to go get a hot chocolate after this, uh, but I'll stay back for a bit more. But if you want to come get hot chocolate or whatever, we can we can continue that way. Um, oh my God, Lucy, darling! Oh my God, what? Holy shit! Sorry, I just I get so excited when I see people's work. <laughs> All right, Lucy, kick us off. How did you get this stunning? What was your one word you Googled? And how did you deliver such a stunning live scribe? Uh, the one word was Sina. I wasn't sure what it meant. It was some volcanic stuff. Yeah. And then with the 
this has like jellyfish, water, which went for trying to like uh, specific simple ideas. Still struggling with processing all the information and putting it down. So I'm getting there. <laughs> You're really getting there, and I love what's really showing that is that characteristics list you've got going on. You immediately picked up, ah, oh, shit, she's describing a creature, um, and you've just gone straight for what are those things, which is really, really important. So, like, the next level of that sort of representation would be um, <clears throat> to note down the cousins, like, all these things, and then you would center... I, what I would have uh, been doing is centered that around a crazy version of that starfish that I probably would have drawn in a break or something, and then, you know, you kind of have that and all the descriptor around it. Um, so that's just the next level that I'm, I'm sure you're interested in, so that's why I'm sharing it. Um, beautiful. Love it. Jordan, how did you get to this? Um, I just thought there's a lot of what you were talking about is like very factual, so I think maybe we will speak to all of them because it's all kind of like your work, so much more effective and like yeah. being a container about it being exactly a square. Um, I, I just kind of, kind of pulled that one out. <laughs> like, yep, yeah, this, this will, this will do. And I was going to draw the main stuff from the center, but then I'm like, I ran out of time, so I just did a little, like, little corner. I see like, him. Creatures and all that stuff. Yeah, and you've done the exact same thing, right? Like, you've, you've picked up on those characteristics, but you've added the starfish in, which is what I was just describing. Um, love that you nicked my speech bubbles. I said speech bubbles are the best container. Um, they're so good. Now, did you pre-draw any of this, or did you draw this completely so when I started talking? I did the, uh, the first speech bubble as you were just as you were like reading out the title and mm -hmm. everything. I just copied and pasted it, but like flipped it around and everything, so I could have like this nice parallel on the side mm -hmm. and everything. And quickly drew the top one, just like the top title as you're speaking out the title, mm -hmm. like the little like container four, and I thought, I thought, oh, water, that kind of looks like blood. I'll do teeth. It's a dangerous creature. We don't know what it is. <laughs> and it shreds its pixel. No, I really love that. And like, that's that good use of time, right? Like you were like, she read the title, you were like, and while I was writing it up, you were probably creating that thing. And I also liked you said, um, you know, you just flip, you duplicated it and flipped it essentially is what I got that, from that method. Um, when you're working digitally, I can use those those tools and techniques. I had the worst friend ever said to me once, like, you know, using the transformation tool is cheating essentially, yes. right? And it's, it took me years to realize that as digital artists, we are allowed to use Control-Z. We are allowed to use the layer blending modes that doesn't detract from our art, it enables it. So um, really, like really just use those fucking cheats. Your speed is key and you did that. Anyway, <clears throat> Xander. Ooh, much more like simple, factual sort of approach. Love the visual relations. How'd you go? What was the one thing you Googled? Yep. Uh, I, I'm going to be honest, I lost track of what you were saying for one of it. I didn't think it was just trying to like think of what you were saying. So, one of them just going over my head, I'm like, wait, did she say eight or nine? I'm just, you know. Yeah. And what you did, I love that you didn't stop. You just like chucked some words in there. Um, at this level, like eight, whether the number eight or nine is there, that's something you can sense check after, right? You can, you can polish that up. The scientist who delivered that speech would go, ah, he has eight legs, please fix that number um, in a review session. But, um, you know, this is a, I, I love this like very lovely um, heading you've got here. And you did the right thing again. Like you've got some really strong clustering and things like that. Shara, how'd you go? Ah, <laughs> Deep. <laughs> how did you go? What was the one thing you Googled? Uh, I also looked up CMS. Yeah. I did Google the other source, I guess I don't know what I just wrote for memes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I have an idea of what scientists are. Mm -hmm. Love these little icons you've got with the deep sea, with the anchor. Again, synonymous with going deep, sea, beautiful representation there. Um, the light bulb, told you you'd be drawing a light bulb sooner or later. Um, and again, really clear clustering as well. Um, and how did you find the, the the tracking? Was it a bit was it a bit easier now that I've sort of warmed you up and you're kind of yeah, getting to that process? It was definitely a lot easier to just go to compliance and yeah. then we can do things and change things later. <laughs> Especially with like setting up the layers. It's like okay, now I can like do things much easier. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I think, you know, I'm just blown away. Like, I'm actually terrified at how quickly you guys picked this up yeah. and were able to get to those points. Is there a question at the back there or? No, you're just scratching your head. All good. I haven't forgotten you down there, but if you have any questions, come see me afterwards as well. So I'm happy to sort of do a sidebar. Um, yeah. Oh my God, it's so terrifying, but so exciting. I hope you guys have had a lot of fun with me today. I, I love sharing this sort of thing, so I, I really enjoy it. Um, so I guess I'll just quickly transition a little bit to some graphic design stuff. Um, that being my background and us doing some of that work coming up uh, is probably just worth me at a high level kind of going through some stuff. So, um, oh, actually, no, before I transition, I will just go, how do you practice? So, I, I don't know, I made this little graph up ages ago and I just pulled it out for this sort of presentation and, you know, it really is, you just got to put the effort in and take those steps up. So, level one, you're setting to practice while listening to doing anything. Watching TV, listening to a podcast. Podcasts are great to practice on, by the way. Uh, and if you ever listen to Belinda Blinked, My Dad Wrote a Porno, uh, that is also the funniest podcast. If you have not listened to it, please do. Um, you will not be able to practice to that because it's so funny. Um, but really what you're trying to uh, practice at that level one is getting your hand used to moving while your ears are working too, right? Like we as artists probably have different ways and processes in which we get into that flow or into that um, pool. Um, whether that be music or whatever. Um, so you're probably innately already past level one, but um, it's important being able to focus on drawing, but also focus on that synthesis and listening and that really deep listening you need to do. Level two is practicing grouping and clustering, which we've done um, and you guys have picked up really well. Um, it's, it's something called mind mapping. Um, if you're curious around a little bit more around how people group information, I won't go into it. Um, and you know, don't do verbatim text. Um, is really, I, I hate to go about the thing, but it, you can pause. You can pause your pen, listen to what they're saying, note it down, make the visual, and then repeat it, right? It's like, pause, okay, they've said this, I've noted it down, okay, they're still talking about that, or I can draw something around it, okay, they've moved on, what are they saying? All right, cool, noted that down, draw something around it. Um, that's a really, like, that's sort of just literally what I'm doing, like, at a bare bones level. Level three, you're progressing up to drawing what you hear and beginning to build your library. So containers, people, representations. So I drew illustrative people, but you can see even in this graphic up the top there, I, I know how to draw a silhouette. I've got various actual icons and styles that I can use so that all my scribes don't look exactly the same. There's different representation. And I always, you know, light bulbs, people, speech bubbles, I always try to like refresh them every six months. Like, I've been drawing this a lot. Okay, what's the next representation of that? Or the, the slightly different representation. Um, <clears throat> uh, action and arrow. So those, th those little things there, um, I would note them down if you're curious. Those are really what you would be looking to really build on and uh, create. Level four, start doing it in meetings or in class. Uh, start practicing. Like nothing will get you quicker and better at listening and drawing than doing it. Um, and doing it with people around. And it's about to that point of building confidence. Um, to really get to get the big money and to get that $1,200 paycheck for a full day's worth of work, uh, you have to be good enough and you have to be confident enough to do that. Um, it's not impossible. Uh, and one day I will, I will achieve that paycheck too. Uh, level five, uh, start doing it in front of people on whiteboards. So this was just from my old context of my work. We had a lot of whiteboards around, but really like start putting up a piece of paper and doing it or come sit next to me and watch me do it like <laughs> that sort of thing so that's just um that's that's my advice and sort of how you would sort of progress through levels on that sort of thing <clears throat> oh graphic design sorry there was so much to cover I should have covered it a bit earlier but I'll pull it up now um all right uh I'm pulling up pentagram so pentagram is a uh incredible design studio at the US. Uh, they do full up graphic design, logos, branding, all that sort of stuff. Um, and they do a lot of entertainment design. So I didn't know this until I was here today. They do the fucking Harry Potter like movie logos. Like they're, they're a pretty cool studio. Um, maybe one day I'll get to do something like this. 
Um, but what I wanted to sort of show you guys. Logo design in order to do it. <laughs> Y'all, I might like logo design if I'm working on the Harry Potter movie, guys. <laughs> um, I'm pulling this up because this is a really interesting thing around um, sort of, there's actually, let me start with the principles. <laughs> Let's go back to step one. Crap. Uh, crap is contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. That is all graphic designers. It's being able to understand how do you create information hierarchy with color and contrast. Uh, what do you repeat? That goes to like icon design or formatting your layouts. Um, what are those common structures? Alignment. You want your design. You want a design to look. You want a page to look nice. Make shit aligned. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into this when I show you my examples I have here. And proximity. Things related to each other should be close to each other, and things that have nothing to do with each other should be far away from each other. Like, it's basically just like common sense at this stage. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm a little rusty, so like, you know, the, if you just Google graphic design principles, it gives you lots of things. So alignment are those, um, come on, sure. Oh, here we go, I nearly reloaded this. So like contrast, contrast in color, value, contrast in shape and direction. <coughs> Alignment that is left aligned, centered, right, top, bottom, all that sort of stuff. Uh, repetition, you've got the like icons or the shape, the same width, um, things like that, and proximity. So Google this sort of stuff. Um, you know, I'm not pulling this stuff out of my ass. It's all there. Uh, you know, I talk about hierarchy a lot when I talk about graphic design, and that is, you know, highlighting titles, placing the key message in higher levels, adding shapes, and implementing design. So. Uh, and this is like, you know, a lot of my artwork is kind of a bit graphic because I come from that background and I follow these sort of rules naturally. Um, I wanted to quickly talk about this guy because he looks cool. Um, but, you know, look how representative. It's a, a couple, a handful of strokes on a blue dot. And I really liked it because it was like, that's what I'm sort of getting to when I talk about representation and graphic iconography. Like, this doesn't look like an accurate dog, but you know it's a dog. Um, and you know you can see some good things here, like really good contrast up here, uh, related proximity. Uh, these, are, this is just fun graphic design. I really like these. Um, you know, this only works because it's really bold. Um, if you had thin, like non-contrasting type here, you wouldn't be able to read it, and all you would read is is best. Um, but isn't that cool? Like in this design, even if you the 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 thing that you read number one is best, right? Like what's best and then you, when you look at it more it's like rescue and then Battersea and you're instantly going like relating rescue and Battersea to is best like that's what they're doing in this design as, as like a sort of communication piece um, so if you're like really want to sort of understand a little bit more around like hierarchy and how to improve graphic recordings or even your presentation files just have a look at good design and pay attention to how they've laid things out the spacing the contrast and the repetition there um, and I just pulled this up because we're all interested in Warner Brothers. Um, like, look at this cool gradient. Like, they've done some really good stuff. I'm just trying to see if there's anything relevant here. Uh, different contrast, diff pattern, repetition, creating beautiful stuff there. Um, come on, show me something more interesting. Jeez, this is a good branding. Just FYI, if anyone's curious, it's good branding. Um, yeah, it's all boring, all that ahead stuff. They would have got paid a buttload of money to do this. Um, and this is one I came across the other day, um, and this is a really good example of complex visualization. Um, so this is the sort of stuff that I really like doing, which is taking complex information um, and distilling it down into a narrative. So when you read through this, it takes you, um, introduces the concept that carbon um, emission isn't new. We haven't been talking about climate change recently. It's an old concept. And it starts telling you like how the carbon budget and stuff works, but like very simple representation, very simple engaging texts. Um, and as you move through it, it, it grows. Um, you know, you've got contrast of color here, contrast of shape, even though they're the same circle, this guy is like wiggling um, and things like that. So what I wanted to also quickly show you was this. So this was my presentation. Um, file that I designed for my uh, thing that we did. And what you'll notice if I do some things is, is it control G? Control it, command G. Try to get my guides up. I'll just go to my view. 
control R. No, it's just, there we go. No, guides, here we go. So what you can see here is um, these are custom guides I've put in. <clears throat> and when, when alignment, when we talk about alignment in graphic design, I mean, that should probably sit there. But <laughs> where you, you build yourself a structure and a grid in which you talk to. So like my, again, they're all off slightly, but like essentially like that would be the consistent sort of thing that you do. Uh, what I did also is I built myself a, use, a, a navigation piece because I knew it was going to be like 30 million slides. We're talking about how weeks, how things are progressing through weeks. Um, so, you know, you can see down the bottom here, I've got a very discreet little bar. It's not super overpowering, um, but it's got enough contrast that when you notice it, you can read it. And when I thumb, thumb through it, that moves across. So you can actually see how things are progressing. Um, through that and I built that with just some some basic graphic design stuff um, and that sits all the way across my presentation um, you know every week it moves through to another set so yeah and then got some graphic some more graphic recordings I really like this guy here um, this was one of the, the experimental ones I did with using sort of pattern and repetition um, to really create these sort of shapes um, and it was a good day because I think uh, Tim was talking a bit a bit slowly or spending a lot of time unpacking concepts. So I was able to sort of really push some of this illustration. I pre-drew this, um, well, I, I did this bit, what, you know how he spends like 10 minutes like waiting yeah. for everyone to turn up? I did that in 10 minutes while people were turning up. Um, again, you know, this is a process and I've just illustrated a little bit of the kind of like key steps and stuff there. Um, what else have we got in the background? Um, yeah, this is a course studio lecture, same sort of thing. Uh, Houdini, oh yeah. Uh, learn to draw a monitor. Everything, everyone loves talking about digital shit these days. Uh, learning how to draw a monitor is helpful. <laughs> um, and things like that. And I just spent time, like this This looks like a, like a labor intensive graphic, but really, um, you know, these are a couple of headline points that the lecturer made as they were talking about rigging. And while they were talking, I built this little guy and then built the graphics sort of around him. So, you know, it looks complicated, but it was really quite natural when I did it. Um, but that's the end. I'm going to stop talking. Um, I am just going to say thank you so much for coming along, um, being a great crew and just letting me blab at you. If you have any questions, if you want to talk about graphic design, uh, want any advice on it or anything like that, or want to come talk graphic recording, come sit next to me, come chat. I'm very friendly. And I want to thank Cassie, who uh, has actually put a lot of effort into organizing these sessions. Um, I get to kick off, I get the privilege of kicking them off, and I will see you guys at the other ones, but a shout out to you. <sighs> yeah, so, um, Lights. Don't forget that like, we've got a whole bunch of uh, records <laughs> and records for four days.
Cool, so tonight's session will be uh, 